Good morning, St. Thomas. Good morning. Good morning, indeed. It is a thrill, a privilege to be back among you on this gorgeous day. It is a gorgeous day in Delaware. And why are you in here listening to me? You're not. You're in here worshiping the living God. Amen. Amen. I just happen to be the person given the privilege of stepping into this pulpit on this day, but we're all here to worship the living God, and I am privileged to be with you. Before I start preaching, there are a couple of things I would like to mention. First of all, it is today the 14th anniversary of your rector's ordination to the priesthood. Congratulations, 14 years. I think he's getting the hang of it. What do you think? <laughs> I think he is indeed. And secondly, I, I, I don't mean to brag, but I, this year, have hit a home run. I've hit a grand slam home run, you see. I had the great pleasure of inviting to join the mission support office someone named Terry Quinn Gray, who's going... <laughs> Terry has graciously said, yes, she's invi I've invited her to become the new chief operating officer of the Episcopal Church in Delaware, and I could not be more excited. Thank you for saying yes. And one other note, I just want to note that I recognize that you at St. Thomas this morning have combined two worship services into one. And you're making a powerful statement. Now, you could say, well, the statement we're making, Bishop, is you told us we had to. But that's not, <laughs> that's not really the statement that I'm seeing. I ask you to do this because of the larger statement around the unity of the church. To use this opportunity to come together and be together as one. That's why I ask parishes to do it. To make manifest what it means to be a church. One church. And many churches, like yourselves, need to split their, their services over multiple times, and I understand that completely. But here's an opportunity for us all to be one. And I know that it inconveniences everybody a little bit. But let me tell you, it's a powerful thing to all be together in the same room. And I thank you, thank you for that. Unity matters in the church and beyond. We are in church, so why don't we talk a little bit about Scripture? Today, I'd like to focus on the reading from Acts chapter 8. You've heard me say before that when you open up a Bible, you very much are walking into a library curated by the Holy Spirit. It's tempting to think of this as a single book because it is bound under a single cover, but we know that the Bible was curated over many centuries by the Holy Spirit. Many different authors have contributed to it. There are many different types of books within this great book within this library. We have books about the biographies of Jesus, right? The gospels that you know well. We have books of law, books of history, books of poetry. Today we're pulling one of those history books off the shelf. shelf. The book of Acts is the history of the church from its very earliest days. Christ has died, he's risen, he returned to his disciples and very early in Acts, Christ leaves bodily. He ascends into heaven and says, guess what church, you're in charge. All that stuff that I said I was going to ask you and expect you to do. Guess what, church? You're in charge. Do this work. Call on me. And, 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 and to empower you, the Holy Spirit is coming to fill you up, church. But I'm stepping away. I am diminishing so that you, the body of Christ, in this world can get, this is one way of saying it, get your act together and go out and serve the world as I have taught you. And that's exactly what the book of Acts describes the people of God getting their acts together. Isn't that a funny pun on that book of Acts, getting your act together? I just made that up. Thank you. <laughs> I guess I won't use it again. But anyway, <laughs> getting their act together and becoming the church, the body of Christ in the world. We've opened books, uh, the book of Acts in this library. And of the 20, 26 chapters of Acts, that we're in chapter 8. So we're near, the, we're in the first, the first bit. The church has grown explosively. It is drawing the attention of people around. Many of its leaders, many of the original apostles, Peter and John and James most notably have been thrown in jail. 
They've created these, this new order of, of folks within the church. It's grown so quickly. They've created the, these, these, these folks called deacons. We've got a deacon today, Sheila, who is a, the inheritor of this original tradition. But folks were crafted because the church was growing so quickly, they needed help taking care of folks within the church. So many people were, were joining. And one of these deacons we hear, Philip, hears a call from God. And God, for the Holy Spirit, it says, the Holy Spirit says, Philip, I need you to take a trip down the wilderness road. Take a trip, Philip. And so Philip does. Get up, the scripture says, and head down the road. The Holy Spirit is a key actor in Acts. The Holy Spirit is meant to be a key actor in our lives as members of the church. Philip heard the Holy Spirit and did just that. He headed down the road walking. And as he's walking, he sees a chariot. The chariot's moving. It, it doesn't say whether the chariot's moving or sitting still, but you have to imagine the chariot is moving along. That's what chariots do. But, and and he, is, he hears within the chariot someone reading one of the, the prophets. Someone else had opened up this great library of the Bible and gone to the prophecy section and picked up the biggest, fattest book in the prophecy. The biggest would have been a scroll at the time. Pulled Isaiah and was reading from the prophet Isaiah. And Philip said to this, this, this the, the, the man who was in the chariot is a treasurer for a foreign queen, a queen of Ethiopia. And Philip asks him, do you understand what it is that you're reading? The treasurer, the eunuch replies, how can I unless someone guides me? Philip told him about what he was reading. You've read the scripture, you heard it today. To understand about Jesus Christ, one who was one who was not recognized as a powerful king, one who was a lamb led to the shearer, somehow plays a role in our salvation. And the eunuch was so moved, he said, Philip, what will prevent me from being baptized right now? Imagine talking about the faith to someone you've just met, and they say, wow. Wow. Can I go to your church and get baptized right now? What would you say? Come on, bring it on in, right? Come, taste and see. I had to figure this out as a priest. Early on in my priesthood, the prayer book teaches us that there are special days when baptism is most appropriate. Around All Saints Day, around the, or the Sunday of Jesus' own baptism, or the the Easter Vigil, these are times historically when baptism is most appropriate, but it does not say that you've got to wait when somebody is approaching the font and somebody wants to make a commitment to Jesus Christ. You don't have to make them wait to All Saints Day. You don't have to make them wait until Pentecost. You want to feed the hungry, amen? amen. When the eunuch said, can I be baptized, Philip said, let's do this thing. And he did. Philip knew a good thing. All of this from the risk of taking a walk in the wilderness, going somewhere the Holy Spirit had told him to go, and talking and listening compassionately, and talking compassionately about Jesus Christ. Philip basically went and opened a door for that eunuch, and the Holy Spirit rushed in and did the work. In 2011, when I was a priest in Charlotte, North Carolina, I joined a program called Leadership Charlotte. And the purpose of Leadership Charlotte, there are many programs like this across the country where the, the participants are called, invited to do this because they're interested in making the city in which they live a better place. And the idea is you bring in thought leaders within a community, folks who are in some kind of leadership capacity, and help them not only learn about the strengths and weaknesses, the struggles of a, of a local place, but for them to build networks so that after the program ends, they can, through their networks, enrich that community. I absolutely loved Leadership Charlotte. Three-year commitment. And I had the wonderful support of my parish to do it. Through that time, we went and we studied, the, studied local government, studied how the policing system worked. We visited local jail. We went and visited civic services visited the school, the Department of Education. We rode, uh, we were invited to, and we all expected to ride our local public transportation and see how well or how, how it, well it wasn't working. 
We learned about housing and the struggles there. There were roughly 50, group, 50 folks in my Leadership Charlotte group. I made some really good friends. And a number of them decided they wanted to come, after meeting me, said, I want to come to your church and see what that's like. So they visited my parish, usually in groups. One man kept coming by himself and then eventually brought his wife and his two kids. And he asked me for a private meeting. He said, Kevin, I would like to know, my wife and I would like to know, will you baptize our younger daughter? Our older daughter is already baptized. Will you baptize our younger daughter? And then he said, and will you baptize me? He said, I was never baptized as a child. We barely went to church. When our older daughter was baptized, I just wasn't interested in it, but something is different now. And so that was a fun day at the church, having the whole family there, the mom and the dad, the older daughter, who was the baptism expert for her younger daughter. That's always fun. <laughs> but the kids howling as their dad got soaking wet. They wanted to make sure I got dad good and wet, and I did. <laughs> and he was a good sport, but loved it. It was a joyful, joyful day. He went from wondering if he would be embarrassed to be a grown man up front being baptized alongside his daughter to standing there calling it one of the very best days of his entire life to be baptized into this faith. The dad said to me, this would never have happened if you had not talked so openly and comfortably about your church. You were not a priest who was talking down to me, whether... I saw just another man talking happily about his church. Before that, I really didn't know what church could be like. What that friend was saying to me is, how could I understand until someone guided me? How could I really know until someone walked the steps with me? And yes, in retrospect, I was a guide for him, but I did not realize I was doing it. He was not a passive player either. He asked questions along the way. He showed up. He wanted to know more. When you think of your own life, you think of the, the days, the weeks, the months, the years that you're living, the things that you choose to do, the things that you choose not to do. You most likely, I can almost guarantee, I can guarantee that along the way you have had the help the deep help of some teacher, some guide, some mentor, some friend who helped you get from where you were to where you are. Every job, every key skill I have, whether it's leading a liturgy, whether it's doing financial management, whether it's knowing how to score baseball, I'm really good at scoring a baseball game, by the way, whether it's knowing how to ride a motorcycle, whether it's knowing how to make my grandmother's biscuits, I have been taught and guided in each one of these things along the way. I did teach myself how to juggle when I was in high school, but even then I was reading a book, so the author taught me. I was guided. We all are the people who we are because someone has taught us, guided us. Now, I'm not trying to make this sound like a high school graduation speech, but I am trying to remind us that we need each other and that our lives intersect and overlap and the things that we do for and with each other matter deeply. How can I know unless someone helps me understand? And this is especially true of our faith. Yes, I was glad to, to learn from my grandmother how to, to make her biscuits but I tell you what, I am even more happy that my grandmother made me go to church as a kid and helped me understand in some way that there is a life bigger than what I knew in western North Carolina. When I taught baptismal prep classes as a parish priest, I encountered early on and came to expect this remarkable blind spot that some parents bring with them in child rearing. Many parents will say, you know, it is really important for my children. I've got to make sure they get a good education. They've got to know how to read. They've got to know how to write well. They've got to know math. And in fact, I, I also want my kids to learn a, uh, to play a sport so they're athletic. I also want my kids to, to maybe play an instrument so they learn a little bit about music or, or become an artist so they're well-rounded. But then some of those same parents will say, but when it comes to faith, I'm not going to push them anywhere. I'm just going to let them figure it out. 
I'm willing to bet you've encountered that same kind of logic. When it comes to the life of faith, among the most important decisions you and I will make, we're just going to let our kids figure it out. Wow. You never force faith. I would never want to force trigonometry on anybody, but I certainly do not want to force faith because that's not the way this works. Philip did not show up in a chariot forcing anybody to do anything. But you help the next generation. You help those around you to understand. We're all guides. We are all called by the Holy Spirit at some point sent out into the wilderness if we will but listen, if we will but get our act together and listen to teach the faith that is within each of us. And you don't have to be an expert. You don't have to go to seminary. You don't have to be ordained a priest or a bishop or a deacon to talk about your faith. That is one of the, the great errors, even excuses. But what you do need is a compassionate heart willing to listen and willing to speak about your story of faith. That's where it all begins, is speaking about your own story of faith. And it really begins, the easiest way to get started is talk about the church that you love. That's all I was doing, talking about the church that I loved in Charlotte. We are all guides. And I tell you, you're not... You need not go far to find a wilderness in which to share your faith. There are people all around us for whom the gospel, the loving gospel of Jesus Christ is foreign to them. People like my friend saying, I didn't even know what a church could be like. This is what evangelism is. What Philip did, what, what I did, what you do. It's guiding others. Not pressuring, not annoying, not, not annoying people, not bullying them, but sharing and guiding and inviting. I want to be clear, I joined Leadership Charlotte. I, my job was not to convert anybody. I did not go in there thinking, how many of these folks can I harvest for Jesus Christ? That was not why I went in. I wasn't even looking to draw them to come to my church. I didn't wear my collar. It wasn't part of it. My goal was to learn about my city and be committed to my community and help make it stronger. And as I got to know folks, as they got to know me, they got to know my passions, what was important to me, my priorities, and I couldn't help but talk about my church. I spoke openly and comfortably about church, this friend said, and that's what got it started. You too have something amazing and powerful you have a soul-changing and world-changing gospel in your hearts. That's why I think those friends came by my church. They knew me, but I think in their hearts more deeply, they wanted something deeply. They were hungry and hoped, hoped the Episcopal Church might help them. We have here the, the very way, the truth, and the life, the foundation of the moral life of character, of compassion, self-sacrifice and of justice. St. Thomas, the Holy Spirit is sending us all, sending you out, sending the entire Episcopal Church in Delaware out, sending the body of Christ out into the world along a wilderness road that may be just a few blocks long. Fewer and fewer people have any direct experience with Christians in this day. And a lot of their exposure to Christians is indirect, and it's rather hostile. They hear some rather loud Christians, some angry, self-righteous Christians who tell them just how bad a person they are. None of you is in church today because you're an angry, self-righteous person because you want to tell the rest of the world how bad they are. Am I right? Yes. Am I right? Yes. You are here because of the gospel of Jesus Christ that preaches love, self-sacrifice, compassion, mercy. And the world needs to hear that. Amen. Folks outside are asking, is there more to living than this? Does God really care? Does life really make sense? They are asking, how can I understand 
unless someone guides me. And the Holy Spirit is saying to us, St. Thomas, is, you are that someone. Take up the charge. Share your faith. Tell your story. And be ready because you're going to open a door and the Holy Spirit will come charging through. Amen.